Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Welcome. Uh, this meeting is going to be broadcast, this discussion is going to be broadcast to Brazil and will become a television program. So uh, when we reach the level of questions from the audience, at the end, I would ask you to wait for the microphones because not only is the only way to register the sound, but also the simultaneous translation will require the, the microphone to catch your voice. Uh, my name is Silvio Bocanera. I'm a Brazilian journalist. Uh, we're doing this for Global News, Brazilian television. We have a very interesting discussion ahead of us. Uh, the topic, as has been given to us, is are the BRICS in a midlife crisis? That is the big question. Uh, it refers, of course, to the reduction in the growth of GDP in all the countries of the, of, of the BRICS. Uh, the BRICS are no longer the darlings of the international investors. There are threats by international agency to reduce the ratings, the credit ratings of some of the countries. And there's also the new threat of foreign investments pulling out of the BRICS as a result of the action of the feds in Washington. The theme of our discussion could actually be, are the BRICS dead? Are they in life supporting machines? Can they recover from this midlife crisis? Uh, let me quote a report launched at Davos here last Sunday by the chief economist of the consulting group IHS, Narima Beravesh. He says, turn out the lights. The BRICS party is over. Not very subtle. But is he right? Is the party over? It's been 13 years, as you recall, since uh, Jim O'Neill of Goldman Sachs created the acronym of the BRICS, uh, pointing out that you know, these countries required attention because they were growing quite a bit. The governments of the BRICS were smart enough to take advantage of that, that sudden fame, and create a group that tried to act together an international forum, even though they had as many differences, they had similarities. They still meet as a group. In fact, they're going to meet in Brazil soon. They're going to try to match it with the World Cup so they can watch a couple of matches as well and see Brazil become the champion. <laughs> uh, as the BRICS slowed down in economic power and prestige, even Jim O'Neill has moved on to another acronym. Now he talks about the mints. Uh, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. The new stars on, on the world stage of economic performance. Mint sounds, sounds fresh, sounds like a fresh breath. The bricks sound more solid, but maybe they're cr crumbling. Interesting metaphors. Which will prevail? We may get some answers here, and you may be able to ask some questions at the end. And you do have a full description of the biography of each one here. It's enough for me to say that uh, we have three ministers of finance, India, South Africa, and Brazil, one deputy prime minister, Russia, and one former top regulator of the bank the banks in China, now with the Fund Global Institute. No prepared statements from our guests. We're just going to have a chat. And uh, perhaps I can start uh, with China. China is growing at a respectable rate of 7.7 .7 a year, not bad, but way below the rates of 11, 12% of a few years back. And a few days ago, mega investor George Soros, who is in Davos, who knows, might even be in this room, uh, said he's more worried about China than he is about Europe. Because 20 years of rapid growth in China, in his words, are running out of steam. I would guess that Minister Montego of Brazil, as much as Soros, 
uh, is also worried because China, after all, is, is a big client of Brazilian products, Brazilian commodities mainly. So my first question to the representative of, of China is, uh, should they be worried? Should Mr. Montega be losing, losing sleep? <laughs> thank you very much for the question, and uh, thank you for showing us the concern from Soros. And uh, uh, the, the concerns about China's health, health is, is something, you know, with linking with its growth pace. Because nowadays we witness the, the growth pace of Chinese GDP is slowing down. That's the fact. As a vis a vis three years ago, it's a 30% down. As a double digit, more than 10% three years ago, and then coming down to 9%. Then seven, seven, eight percent around, and now is seven point seven percent or something. And uh, this coming year, maybe it could be slowing down further a little bit, but uh, in line with the performance of last year, more or less the same. But uh, this is the fact. Uh, of course, the huge stir worldwide. But the Chinese government and China people, now they reach the consensus. Uh, the story behind high-speed development is what? Is credit field fixed asset investment and export-driven economy. What do we get? In the past, what we got is just a very marginal fee-based income. And some projects are not economic viable. So we realize what remains to the Chinese people is uh, pollution, okay? They created some jobs, but the pollution is with us, is part of our life. So we got to change this. So it's our own willingness to reduce the speed a little bit, 30% doesn't matter much, so long as we can keep the speed around 6.9% every year, along to year 2020, still we can realize our goal set by year 2010 that we will double the GDP growth uh, from GDP size of the China, Chinese. So what? 7% is okay for China for the remaining seven years. And we will use that room to maneuver to reduce three things, to do three things. The first, to reduce overcapacity, in line with reduced overcapacity, because most of the overcapacity industries are heavy industries. Steel making, okay, and ferrous, uh, shipbuilding, and uh, many others coal mining, and so on and so forth. So that is the two stories connected with each other. We can you know, kill two birds with one stone. The second thing is to reduce the government, local government platform borrowing. It's a huge zest and ensues them from the localities to pull up the GDP and they are competing with each other, province by province, which is no good. So the third thing is that, by and by, we will change our growth model. And we will try our best to realize that we will reduce the export growth ratio, we will reduce the fixed asset investment ratio, but we will pull up the domestic consumption by pulling up you know, the productivities. And how we can raise the productivity in China? We will rely upon innovation. We are not relying upon the WTO entry benefits no longer. We are not relying upon the cheap labor and cheap land. Now this time is innovation. And how we can realize 
the innovation to pull up the productivity and to raise the income per, pe per person. So the domestic consumption could be a real story. In five years or seven years, by the end of the year 2020, we can initially change the growth model. How can we do that? For China specific, we got to have uh, the boldness, the decisiveness to carry out the reform and the opening up. And that shows our determination. So long as we can balance the decisiveness like that with credibility, I think China will move out the problem. Is so it's a, it's a top-down decision to change the model. And uh, it's welcomed by Bhutan. It's a huge country. You know, when all of a sudden you decide on a new model mm -hmm. and to actually carry it out, mm -hmm. has a lot of risk. Uh, what, what kind of risks do you see ahead? Of course, the profitability will be, the profit growing ratio will be going down. Then then performance assets and loans will be rising automatically, okay? Because it's a trade-off. It takes time to realize that goal. So it's actually, it's, uh, we create something to backfire ourselves, okay? To push us to think about how we can change, how we can change the growth model and how quickly we can do that. But during that process, it's a painful, but no pain, no gain, as saying goes. I wonder if Mr. Montague feels more at ease now. Will he sleep well tonight after hearing this explanation? I don't sleep well this night because the air... So they can get the phones. Okay. You can put it on top. Yes, ready? Okay. Are you ready? Eu não dormi bem esta noite. I must say I didn't sleep well last night because the heating was too strong in my room. So I woke up in the middle of the night and I was sweating and it had nothing to do with China, I must say, because I believe that China and its economy will be revised and reformed, the model will be changed, and it will continue to be the most dynamic economy in the world, at least for the foreseeable future. The, la the next decades. I don't think we're facing a, a midlife crisis, us, the BRICS. What I see is a world economy crisis that somehow affected the BRICS by reducing the trade volume, by reducing international demand. Now, of course, the world economy and the developed countries that caused the storm are now recovering, but that recover, recovery is gradual and it's a process. And with that recovery, we will likely have a reactivation of trade growth. Trade before the crisis was growing at a rate of 6, 7 percent per annum not talking, not even considering the, the price of commodities. From this point on, I think commerce will again experience a 4 to 5 percent growth in the future. It's not going to go back to the levels that we had in the past, but I still do believe that the BRICS will continue to lead that effort in the global economy. But for that to happen, of course, the BRICS will have to be serious about introducing some uh, some reforms. In the case of China, the change in the model is already the subject of discussion and the G20 discussions. China has a level of overdevelopment, a lot of idle capacity, and it de depends greatly on external demand. So the model has to be changed so as to create some more internal demand and thereby decreasing the level of investment or the reliance on investment. We also need to increase investments that are 
geared to more growth and innovation. I think China is coming out of a phase where expansion was based on a model that is now giving birth to a different kind of setup that will eventually bring about more growth. I think, I still do believe that China will continue to grow 7 to 8 percent over the next decades. It's never going to go back to you know, 12, 13, 14 percent, as was the case in 2007, the year before the crisis. But I, well, in the case of India also, uh, here's another economy that's going to continue to grow, and again, not at 9 or, or 8 percent, but at 6 percent, say, which is already a very, very good level in global economic terms. And since it is based on low income, there will likely be a convergence towards medium income and, and high income. So I believe that in the case of Brazil, change will go the other way, and we're going to go a different way. Uh, for a moment there, you said that the countries, the BRIC countries, will have to change their models. What change would that be in Brazil? What kind of model would you change in Brazil? Exatamente o que eu ia dizer agora. Então, no Brasil, nós já temos um mercado consumidor avançado. O Brasil, nos últimos anos, fez uma grande inclusão social. Expandiu a classe média. Mais de 40 milhões de brasileiros... Expanding its middle class by more than 400 million. It has reduced poverty, so we have a large consumer market that we have built in recent years. We are the fourth world market in automobiles, uh, third in uh, physicians, and so forth. In order to activate this market, we are lacking credit. Credit is still scarce, but most importantly, uh, investment is what is going to drive Brazil's economic growth. And that's why the that's the reason the government is encouraging investment in Brazil. In 2013, investment growth the investment growth rate was about six and a half percent, a six per half percent compared to the previous year. That was uh, the fastest growth growth we've had in foreign investment. We've extended a, a, a large program in concessions for, in, for infrastructure. We've been, uh, we've held a number of auctions in 2013. Uh, they were very successfully handled. We will have new, new uh, auctions for oil and gas, highways, electricity. This year we will also be uh, opening bidding to ports, airports, and railways. So we have an extensive program of more than $250 billion worth of investment uh, taking. That's not including the oil and gas sector, which is another large number of billions. So we're going to continue that investment. Investment will continue to grow in Brazil. It is a uh, partnership between the government and the private sector. These are concessions. These are licenses. It is not the government that will perform the work. It is the private sector. But that will bring new investment. The, it, we will need uh, foreign trade. We will depend less and less on foreign trade. Now, as with China, we will have less investment and greater growth. Now, uh, the World Economic Forum published the, its uh, survey of 700 opinion makers around the world a few days ago, from businessmen to politicians, bankers, etc. And they were asked, what is the biggest risk to the global community in the next decade. You know, the expectations, they would say, a new fiscal crisis, uh, climate change. But they actually said it's the income gap between the rich and the poor, which is growing, not shrinking. Some of the BRICs are partic particularly vulnerable in that area. Brazil is, uh, India is, uh, South Africa. So I would appreciate if you give your evaluation of this conclusion of the highest risk. Well, that's a risk. Um, income inequality and middle class stagnation are risks to every country in the world. In the US, I'm told that uh, real wages have been stagnant for the last 20 years. In the UK, 
uh, wages have risen slowly, more slowly than inflation. So I think this is true of many countries. In developing countries, the early winners of development, the early winners of high growth, are the well-to-do. But that doesn't mean we are not lifting millions of people who are below the poverty level, above the poverty line. China has lifted about 500 million people above the poverty line. India has lifted 150 million people above the poverty line. So while there is income inequality, and we must address that, we must also recognize that people at the very bottom of the pyramid are being lifted upward. In India, for example, rural wages have grown in real terms at 7% a year over the last five or six years, um, which is one of the reasons why food inflation is high, one of the reasons. So I think uh, there are several forces at play. We are concerned about income inequality. We would like to tax the rich a little more. But since we need capital to be formed in the hands of the entrepreneurial class, and we encourage them to reinvest the capital, we are going slow on that. But as long as we're able to lift a large number of people above the poverty line, I think we are doing reasonably well. In this, in this issue of the changing the model in order to grow more, what's India doing to try to reach the levels of the past or close to it, go beyond the levels of today? You see, our growth declined firstly because of external environment and secondly because of some decisions that we took and some decisions we did not take. But in the last uh, year and a half, we have acknowledged that we need to be more decisive, we need to move forward at a rapid pace, and the results are there to see. The economy has stabilized, investment is back, both foreign direct investment as well as domestic investment, and the global economic outlook prediction for India for calendar 2014 is 6.2%. I have predicted that in calendar 2014, which is more or less the same as our financial year 2014-15, nine months of this calendar and three months of the next calendar, we will grow at 6% plus, and next year we will grow at 7% plus, and the year after that, we will achieve our potential growth rate of 8% plus. In the worst year, our savings to GDP was 30%. In the best year, it was 36%. Even today, we are saving about 32% of our GDP. So I think if we avoid some of the mistakes we made, and if we are more decisive, if we are able to implement with a kind of single-mindedness with which, say, China, Japan implement their projects, we will get back to high growth. I have no doubt in my mind, in three years, we'll be back to 8% growth. Uh, <clears throat> Minister uh, Gordon, South Africa also suffers from this problem of uh, inequality brought out uh, in the foreign report. Uh, many political and economic analysts actually took advantage of the, the recent events in South Africa, the death of uh, Nelson Mandela, to bring out the fact that 20 years after the end of apartheid, that gap is still very high. What has been done to change that, and what needs to be done to change that? The gap is still there, but I think the, any review of the last 20 years will tell us that there have been formidable changes uh, in South Africa. Uh, none of the countries at this table had uh, an iniquitous system like apartheid to, to overcome. So the last 20 years has seen the per capita income grow from 27,500 rands to 36,500 rands. Our economy grow uh, two and a half t uh, times in nominal terms. <laughs> Disposable income has grown about 40% during that time. If you look at uh, services to South African citizens who were historically excluded, uh, both economically and socioeconomically, uh, we've built three million houses in this period. Uh, access to portable water has gone up from 50% to close to 
And those figures replicate themselves in other areas as well. In the last few years, uh, our social wage in South Africa is about 57% of our non-interest expenditure. So overcoming a 300-year legacy of colonialism and apartheid is not going to be done in 20 years. And I think we have some illustrious examples uh, in this panel of countries who have tried different things to all achieve the same objective. We want all of our people to have a better life. We want all of our people to have decent jobs and incomes. We want all of our economies to be uh, competitive. And uh, I think over time, we will certainly get there. As Mr. Mantega pointed out, the crisis, this financial crisis that uh, did a huge amount of damage to all of our economies wasn't of our own making. It came from the financial centers of the world, particularly the United States. Up to 2008, South Africa was growing close to 5% for several years. Uh, growth dropped, we've recovered somewhat. But now we have to confront another set of structural challenges that come with our past uh, and with the present as well. So we, we need to diversify our economy. We need to build a more skilled workforce. We need to come overcome some of our constraints in respect of energy and logistics, uh, all of which are either being done or in uh, very advanced planning stages. And the next few years, we'll, we'll see us uh, both increase our potential growth, but also reach our potential growth as well. And most South Africans have been lifted in the last 20 years above the bottom three tiers of uh, uh, the LSM measure that we use in South Africa to, to a lower middle class level than ever before. And uh, that progress will continue as well. Do you, do you see a, a major risk factor coming up uh, in uh, <clears throat> something that is happening in other countries as well, with the BRICS uh, elections? Elections coming up this year. Do you think that will put this project in jeopardy in, in any way? Not at all. I think the, the ruling party, the African National Congress, Mr. Mandela's uh, organization, has always enjoyed more than a 60% uh, vote from South Africans who understand that this is uh, the only organization that can uh, and has the determination to overcome all of these legacies that we are talking about. So there's no doubt about the outcome of the elections. There might be a percentage point this way or that way at the mm. end of the day. If uh, we move on to Russia, uh, uh, President Putin made a speech in December, uh, very critical of the economic performance of Russia. A growth of 1.3% last year, forecast 1.4% for this year. In his own words, uh, the main reason for the economic slowdown are not external, but internal. So let's take the lead from President Putin. What were those internal reasons? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me here to the discussion. And uh, uh, it's very simple, uh, business environment. It's not good enough. The business environment right. overall uh, in the world? Uh, in Russia. We're talking about Russian growth. Uh, there are some external reasons as well. Uh, our major uh, trading partners are uh, Europe and China. Uh, if uh, Europe is uh, uh, almost in recession and China is slowing down a little bit, uh, it's natural for Russia to, uh, to slow down a little bit. Uh, but uh, main reasons are internal. Our saving rate is also 30%, but investment rate is only 20%, even less than that. 10% so uh, um, are not being invested uh, from savings. People don't uh, want to invest more than uh, they, uh, they do. And uh, with uh, such an investment rate, uh, we cannot have growth higher than 2% uh, per annum. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the reality. And the only thing we can do about this is to improve business environment. And we started doing this. But uh, this will bring uh, effects in the medium-term perspective, not immediately, as people uh, will uh, need time to be persuaded. They uh, need to believe that it is not uh, uh, just for one year. It will be continued. Uh, we moved uh, uh, more than 10 pos uh, positions in uh, World Bank rating doing business. Uh, and now we are first among the BRICS countries in this um, uh, rating. But we are far uh, below uh, all uh, major economies. We are uh, uh, number um, 92 only. Uh, 
uh, and uh, there's a long way to go to number 20 that we want to, uh, to have the, in 2018. Is it the Russian business community you're concerned about or the foreign business no, community? No, that's, for, uh, that's both foreign and Russian business community who are being asked uh, uh, about various aspects of business environment. Uh, the same is being done in uh, India, China, South Africa and uh, uh, Brazil. Uh, and our scores are not, uh, not good enough. Uh, and, uh, uh, we need to improve uh, a lot. Some of the things are not really important for growth uh, uh, in this rating, but uh, some things are uh, um, really uh, crucial, uh, like uh, bureaucracy, uh, red tape, speed of uh, uh, getting all the permissions, uh, uh, access to finance, uh, things like that, especially for SMEs, uh, and this is what, uh, what is important. And uh, if we are talking about uh, this, uh, those extra investments, there are two things uh, that are crucial. First, uh, innovation. Investments should be linked to uh, modern technologies. Uh, otherwise, if we will invest in the old stuff, uh, I don't think we will be competitive. I don't think we will win uh, competition. And the second thing, we, we should substitute old inefficient uh, uh, jobs by new efficient jobs. So it's not about adding uh, more jobs. It's about uh, 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 month by month, quarter by quarter, uh, year by year, substitution of old by uh, by new. You know, when you talk about the, the need for investment, Похоже с Бразилией, что Россия инвестировала колоссальные суммы денег в Олимпийские игры. Цифра, которая называется 50 миллиардов долларов, как Бразилия тратит, потратила на чемпионат мира по футболу. Поэтому звучит критика, почему столько тратите на спортивные мероприятия. Позвольте мне внести некоторые коллективы. 7 миллиардов долларов было вложено для строительства спортивных сооружений. Остальное 40 миллиардов было инвестировано в инфраструктуру. Не олимпийские объекты, а дороги, железные дороги, линии передач, электропередач, больницы и так далее, и так далее. Все, от чего зависит жизнь людей в Сочи. И мы фактически создали современный курорт, курорт не только для России, но и для всего мира. То есть все эти инвестиции являются продуктивными. Это было сделано не только ради спортивных состязаний, очень важные инвестиции для страны. И это также обеспечило значительный некоторый прирост ВВП в последние месяцы. Прошу вас, господин министр, к вам вопрос. Может быть, мы наденем наушники? Наш коллега только что упомянул инфраструктурные инвестиции. The criticism in Brazil has been that the investments made in Volca are not as happy infrastructure. It's just building a stadium, wasting money. Based, the, the critics say, and uh, demonstrations in the streets of Brazil last year had that specific focus. You're spending too much money on a football tournament when the country needs infrastructure. What can you tell us about that? Bem, justamente a maior parte dos recursos estão sendo gastos como na Rússia na infraestrutura urbana. E portanto são melhorias que são necessárias, porque nós temos necessidade de mais metrôs, de mais eh, rodovias, meios de transporte, etc. Então, eh, só uma parte está sendo investida na construção dos estádios. O governo federal apenas está financiando, dando financiamento, porque são os estados ou é a iniciativa privada que está gastando para fazer os estádios. E nós acreditamos que haverá um benefício para a população e que a população brasileira ela quer a Copa do Mundo no Brasil. As pesquisas mostram que a população brasileira gosta de futebol, quer a Copa do Mundo e, portanto... É... They're happy about it and everybody is pretty much aware of the fact that on the side we're also going to have a lot of investments. Wait a little bit for the translation. I would like to uh, come back to India on a separate question. It has to do with, there's a, there's a big discussion going around the world. Uh, it's been going for many years, but it's got intensive when you talk about the BRICS as well, which has to do with state intervention in the economy. 
you're all economies where the state has a heavy percentage of intervention. Uh, do you think, in the case of India, the state is just too dominant to the point of creating a, some form of lethargy and hurting the economy? Well, I don't think so. I think uh, the new space that is being opened up is substantially or almost completely occupied by the private sector. The state can't be dismantled overnight, nor should it be. Uh, what happened when US banks and uh, European banks were in a crisis? The state took over the banks. So why do you deny that the state has a role to play? Take our banking industry. We have got government-owned banks, we've got Indian private banks, and we've got foreign banks. And we have promised to license more private sector banks uh, in the next couple of months. So I think there is a role for the state to play and to wish away the role of the state in a developing economy is unwise and wrong. Likewise, we have public sector companies engaged in steel. We have got private sector companies. We have public sector companies producing automobiles. We don't have a, I'm sorry, we have a private sector companies producing automobiles. We don't have a public sector company. We have a one public sector airline. We have several private sector airlines. So I think as long as the public sector company is competitive and is run on commercial principles, there's nothing wrong in having a public sector company. And there's no reason to dismantle it. There must be a reason to dismantle a public sector company. But as I said, the new space that is opening up is almost completely occupied by the private sector. I'd like to ask you about what we raised in, in the case of South Africa, the upcoming election. The risk factor, certainly much bigger than in South Africa, in the election coming up in India. What can you tell us about that? South Africa is in the happy position of a dominant political party uh, dominating the political scene for the 20 years. So did the Congress party in the first 30 years. But since then, we've had other political parties. Um, it's too early to predict the outcome of the election. We have not had a single party with a clear majority since 1991. It's most likely that the next government also will be a coalition government. Now, who will lead that coalition government? I'm unable to say. But if you ask me for my preference, I'm ready to say that. <laughs> <laughs> in the case of China, and another subject, you touched upon it in your first answer. Uh, international analysts are saying that the Bank of China is flooding the economy with excessive money supply, and that there is too much credit. That's the criticism perhaps even a credit bubble, such as in the property area. And too many liabilities. The figure that is thrown around is the equivalent of uh, $3 trillion in uh, municipalities in debt. Are you worried? Should we all worry, considering the importance of China in the international economy nowadays? OK, uh, that's a very good question, yes, because uh, this is a very sensitive, because uh, the, what happened is that, uh, you know, when China moves forward very rapidly in the past 10 years or so, especially after the entry of the WTO, the, we embraced the WTO benefits. So the localities, they build up their leverages during the whole process. Uh, what I witnessed is that the State Statistic Bureau published the data first of its kind in history in China in year 2012, 11, year 2011, I'm sorry, for the data of the legacy, the stock of the loans borrowed by local government by end of year 2010, that is 11 trillion RMB Chinese yuan. And uh, by the end of last year, after two years, roughly, and uh, the State Statistics Bureau published the figure once again. The, the latest census showed us 
that figure came out to his, coming out to his about 21 trillion instead of 11 trillion IMB. So you can see the spiral now. And um, the good news is that China is determined to bring the transparency and the information disclosure to the market. And underneath the total amount, they have classified items province by province about their gearing ratio and their leverage legacy. Uh, this is a very good practice because you put everything under the same line. And uh, I think it, it caught a lot of attention globally, not only in China. And uh, yes, the figure is increasing. Then next step, people will automatically keep digging. How about the quality of that assets and how about the quality of that borrowing? Where the money goes? So that is a very good question. And we raise these things, put under the sunlight, and let people think. And the next step, I think the, the government already showed the roadmap. The first thing, number A, is we will set up the new rules and the legislation. And, uh, we have clear cut the roads regarding the borrowing on the platforms of local government. Which province could borrow the money, which couldn't, if allowed, what kind of limitation they are facing. For example, they got to do their homework seriously to get the public, the balance sheet, cash flow statements, profit and loss counts. And also, they put everything on the website, as other tax authorities does. And then, they will calculate the funding cost and to disclose where the money goes. And furthermore, the item B is the central government decide to reform our taxation system and make sure that uh, the division of the homework done by the central government, the local government, will be redefined. And according to that roadmap and the redefinition, then the resources will be redefined as well. So that is second step. The rule over, the rule over of the rule out of the VAT reform instead of business tax, the Chinese will wipe out the business tax very soon. Instead, we use the westernized the VAT. And that is part of the reduction of the burden of the local government and enterprises. And that we will nourish more ideas about this issue. And we also harness all the banks to do the due diligence from time to time and once again, and to make sure that the exposures could be measurable and could, the risk could be controllable. If not, then according to the risk exposure, all the banks must uh, build up uh, their capitals and the provisionings extra. So this work has already stopped and it never stops until we clean up everything. Okay, I think it's about time to hear from you. Uh, make sure to wait for the microphone, because the interpreter needs it, and the recording also requires it. So we're open to questions from the audience. Uh, there's a gentleman here, and another one there. Let's take uh, some questions in, in pairs. This gentleman here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Salil Shetty. I'm the Secretary General for Amnesty International. Uh, I want to just start by saying that uh, Amnesty International has consistently, uh, sorry, the overall question really is linked to the interplay between economic growth and human rights. I want to see, I want to get some- A sense. question. A question. You're not going to make a speech. No, 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 a speech. Yeah. The question really is about the relationship between the two. Uh, I, I want to say that consistently we've exposed the double standards of Western governments about human rights, whether it's 
the fifth year anniversary of Guantanamo Bay not being closed after Ob President Obama promised it, uh, NSA snooping from the US government, including the, pre the president of uh, Brazil. So let's take that as a given. Uh, my question is to uh, BRICS leaders. Uh, the BRICS countries and constitutions have committed themselves to human rights, so that's a good thing. So if is the magic bullet for the next stage of economic growth actually to liberate significant proportions or sections of the population in the BRICS countries to actually have access to human rights? Women, indigenous people, minorities, if Good. they get it, uh, do you think that's the breakthrough? The gentleman over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Marcelo Neri, uh, Minister of Strategic Affairs from Brazil. Um, getting a bit on this question on human rights, um, the, the point that the biggest risk in the world, as pointed in this in the mentioned uh, research that was mentioned, is inequality. How you see inter internal inequality? How is the median Russian, uh, South African, because you're talking about countries, Brazil, talk about how about Brazilians, Russians, Indians, etc. How do you see in the next stage uh, the, the role of social policies and the connection with uh, internal markets and consumption? Okay, let's hold there for, for a moment. So these two questions. Who would like to uh, volunteer? <laughs> let's say, since you're closer to me, you're I volunteer you. You're volunteering me. Yes. Well, uh, we recognize that human rights must be respected. Every violation of human right must be investigated and punished. But let me also tell this audience, denial of access to drinking water, to sanitation, denial of access to basic health care, those are gross violations of human rights. So a developing country laying out money to ensure that people get food, People get drinking water, sanitation, access to health care. That's ensuring that people enjoy human rights. Development is the answer to many human rights violations in poor and emerging economies. But there are other violations of human rights that take place. Uh, gender injustice, uh, crimes against women and children, uh, caste discrimination, religious discrimination. Those violations of human rights must be investigated and punished. India is an open democracy. We are proud that we are an open, liberal democracy. We will defend the human rights of the, every individual in India. At the same time, we are conscious that poverty denies people human rights, and the elimination of poverty is the best assurance of human rights. Would anybody add, like to add something to it? Mr. Mantega. The government of Brazil places great importance on moving forward in human rights. We have been working intensively in Brazil to implement uh, broad-reaching rights and access to human rights in the following ways, reducing poverty. Over the last 10 years, Brazil has reduced absolute poverty by 90 percent. Secondly, social inequality. This is a problem that increased during the financial crisis in most countries. Inequality increased, whereas in Brazil, we reduced inequality during that same period. Guaranteeing a good job. During the crisis, we saw unemployment grow throughout the world. While in Brazil, we have virtually full employment. People are working and earning more. In addition to that, there have been other advances, such as what Minister Shidi Vahans mentioned, uh, related to health, education, sanitation. These are all priority areas to the Brazilian government. Well, right next to her to make it easy for the microphone. Right there. Right there. Raise, raise your arm so that he would know. Please. Thank you, sir. I am from uh, Yes Bank in India. Sir, when the uh, BRICS started, 
there was uh, energy, there was uh, synergy, and uh, the sigma of that in my judgment was kinetic energy. Today, sir, as I listen, that uh, there are a lot of individual cases which are being presented. The fact of the matter is the world is looking forward to, in this panel today, to define the opportunities between emerging markets. And emerging markets are still the best in terms of growth, best in terms of demographics, best in terms of the ability to consume even the developed markets supply. So a lot of our discussions you know, are somewhat political. It does help to see how can we really connect the economic equation between the BRICS and revive what started with a lot of enthusiasm and is still a very good equation. Thank you. The gentleman near, near you. Hello, I'm Elon Goldberg from Itau Bank. Um, the global context is changing. The next five years will not be equal to the last five. It looks like the global economy is recovering, at least partly, which is a good sign. But at the same time, we are seeing normalization of monetary policy. Financial conditions globally will be tighter. So my question to you is, are you concerned with that? Or are you more relaxed because the global economy is recovering? Would you? OK, in long run, uh, I think uh, the whole global economy is recovering. Let the boy the recovery in the US. Um, this is conspicuous. If you look back, you know, the equity performed, the outperformed the other countries by 30% roughly, 27 to 30% year. And, um, but in short term, the reverse movement of the QE could spill up uh, huge shocks in these areas, EIM markets. So, uh, simply put, my suggestion is uh, pull the cards closer your to, to your chest. So the year to come, we must do, being the bankers, we must do the due diligence more seriously. We must master the risk of the liquidity as a top priority. How thick the capital adequacy is and the structures, how bad, better the structure of your capital is doesn't matter much. The problem is that if you can master, have a good mastery of intraday liquidity on consolidated basis, on group-wise basics, then you will win. Definitely we'll see a huge volatility in capital flows and great rotation of risk appetites. And Mr. Gordon, would you like to add something to that? Yes, I think we must accept that uh, the kind of growth patterns and dynamism that we saw from certain areas of the world isn't going to continue forever. We should accept that we are, if you like, in a new transition towards a new, new normal, if you can use that phrase. What exactly will characterize the new, new normal is not clear, but clearly it won't be the growth rates that we've seen before. Uh, hopefully there will still be a return to investment, particularly fixed investment in this area sort of uh, atmosphere. And in, in this context, it's, it's uh, going to be a test for the G20 in particular, if we can get coordinated macro policies. So whilst uh, my colleague from China says we're going to get a bit of turbulence as a result of tapering of QE, at the same time as uh, my colleagues uh, who participate in the G20 will say, uh, in the last four months, uh, there's been a lot of debate within the, the G20 to manage tapering properly, to communicate effectively, and to create as much predictability and certainty as the tapering process unfolds. And I think uh, many in the Fed have heard us, uh, particularly from the developing uh, countries, uh, quite effectively. And so there are going to be some shifts, but hopefully those shifts are not going to be shocks. The second point is that uh, BRICS is not dead, nor are the emerging markets dead. Uh, we're in, the narratives change as, as they often do in fashionable terms, 
I think we must be careful not to forget that we are an interconnected community of nations and economies, that we are also interdependent, that at different stages now in, in shorter periods and longer periods, it will be either developed countries or the developing countries that will take the lead, contribute more or less to global growth. But unless uh, all of us see all of the world as opportunities for growth and opportunities for investment, we're not going to get the rebalancing that, that uh, is actually required in the global economy, nor are we going to see uh, new poles of growth and demand uh, developing as well. That's what the emerging market story is about at the end of the day. So if you take a global multipolar view, uh, then these are ructions that we've got to live through and manage effectively on the one hand, but that shouldn't amount to a swing, such massive swings in the narrative, uh, which often, as some people have described in the last day or two, shifts in fashion. You know, red is in fashion one day and blue on another day. Uh, we've also got to look at some consistency in, in the way this works. I also want to take this opportunity to say that in South Africa, we also value human rights, and I share the comments of my colleagues. We have a very modern constitution, uh, a Bill of Rights that uh, acknowledges socioeconomic rights in very explicit terms. And uh, what I've described earlier on, in terms of government programs, are all contributions to making sure that all 50, 55 million people who live in South Africa enjoy full human rights and, and human dignity, uh, which is absolutely crucial. Thank you. Minister Dwork. And just uh, <clears throat> very briefly, uh, we do not see any real uh, recovery. We are concerned very much about uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, all those uh, signs of recovery are, from our perspective, not sustainable yet. So in the United States, uh, uh, still loose monetary policy uh, helps uh, uh, to grow a little bit. Uh, uh, but uh, um, the debt level is still uh, unsustainable. At some point, the uh, US uh, um, Fiat will have to tighten uh, at least a little bit. Uh, it's not clear whether uh, uh, energy prices will be uh, as low as now for a long time. Uh, I mean, the shale, gas, uh, shale oil development, we just not, don't know whether it's uh, like, uh, forever or uh, uh, prices will recover at some point and uh, costs will go up again in the United States. Of course, we, Russia would like the prices to go up. The rest of the group would like the prices to go down. Uh, well, uh, our, our new source of, gro of growth are not uh, in oil and gas. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, new source of growth are in other industries. Uh, uh, but uh, more importantly, the Europe, uh, well, 0 0.4 is not growth. Uh, it's, it's 0.4. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's clear that at some point uh, uh, the ECB will have to uh, relax uh, its policy to support uh, growth. Otherwise, uh, Europe is not going to have any growth. Banks will have to adopt uh, Basel III now. They will have to tighten, uh, as was uh, mentioned, their policies uh, uh, and uh, find new instruments to, uh, to finance uh, SMEs uh, as uh, it will be very difficult to uh, give just loans. Uh, so what you're saying uh, is George Soros should go back to worrying about Europe yeah. instead of the BRICS. Uh, well, we, we, uh, we are not separated from the rest of the world. We are dependent on, uh, on, on Europe and the United States. BRICS are uh, uh, a part of the global economy. Uh, it's important to understand. Thank you. Questions? The gentleman over here, the lady over there. Yes, uh, Juan Garrido from Lima, Peru. Uh, Milton Friedman famously said that political uh, freedom reforms normally follow economic freedom reforms. Um, I would like to ask uh, China if uh, we will see political reforms in the medium or term, if we're not going to see a, a one political party, if we're going to see elections and many parties. Thank you. Okay. Um, the uh, just, the just a second, if you could hold for the second question, sometimes they're related. <clears throat> uh, Sheila Nahi with Enphase Energy. Mr. Ming Kang, you referenced the immense problem of pollution in China, and I would just like to know from all of the panelists, do any of you support a carbon tax, or in the alternative, do you support a policy that levels the playing field between the fossil fuel energy and the renewable energy in industry? Okay, uh, very quickly because I will run off time. And to answer your question, political reform must go in line with economic reform, okay? 
And the, the sequence is that economic reform will take a half step forward and to nourish the basic fundamentals. And then you can better people's life and realize some equality on economic way. And in the meantime, that will give you the backfire. Then to push the political reform, you've got to think about that. And Chinese new leaders already started already started the political reform, okay? We are thinking about how to nourish the new rules and the laws. And also, we have already waged a huge campaign in fighting against corruption from top down and from bottom up. Any corrupt fries and any corrupt tigers will be caught according to the rule of law. And in the meantime, only in three months, we abolish the system of labor camp to show respect to the human rights, because the young people who are doing some wrongdoings and, uh, you know, against the rules and laws, but still they could be educated, not necessarily put up behind the bars, okay? The full stop, nationwide, full stop of the level camp. So uh, that's uh, the basic answer to you. And uh, that, uh, that question is closely linked with the human rights. We must uh, improve our human rights. It's a long and important mission. We must bear that in mind. But when we have the poverty and inequality and the pollutions everywhere, we must make sure that where is our focus, OK? But you can, having said that, you can never forget human rights is a very important thing. We got to build up and prove ourselves all along the way forward. And to answer your question, uh, yes, we approved the carbon tax implementation, but make sure that there's no recipe in economic life. Implementing carbon tax can bring us a double-edged sword, okay? So it must go side by side for the big market like China side by side with the carbon trade system, the cap and the trading system, to encourage the people and give them motives to move forward, to kill the pollutants, and uh, to reduce the carbon, and monitor his carbon footprint while he is working on. That is something you can never nourish by carbon tax. But the carbon tax is very you know, feasible, and very quick, but in long run, you got to bring the market force to be a decisive one, to motivate people to do the right things in the long run. China is start to do that. If you want to see the cap and the trash system, please go to Guangdong. Mm -hmm. And if you want to talk with the carbon tax scheme, you can talk to the most people. They'll nourish the scheme very quickly. Thank you very much. I think, you know, time flies when we're having fun. It's been an hour already, and we have to close this. There'll be other people taking over the room. I appreciate you being here. Uh, I think we've come to the consensus over here that the bricks are not dead. They may be taking a nap, but they will wake up soon. I'm not How sure everybody agrees, crisis? but... How do we have a midlife crisis? <laughs> no midlife crisis either. No. Maybe they just need you're to buy far, a sports you're car. You're far from the midlife. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're very young. <laughs> Thanks for coming.